Welcome to a short update with respect to the oil and gas financial model template from efinancialmodels.com. Before we start, if you like to see more videos from us, please push the subscribe button below. The purpose of this template is to evaluate the financial feasibility of an upstream oil and gas drilling project. This model has been updated from a previous version and I'm just going to show you the highlights of this template. The model is structured uh, with three in three uh, main worksheets. We have one summary sheet which basically contains the an overview of the financial results and also the key assumptions which you can see here in the with the blue cells. Then we have a sheet financials which basically puts up a projection schedule of up to 50 uh, years. If you want to use less years, you can do that. I will just come to that and you can also uh, hide some of these <coughs> of these forecast years if you like to. And the sections in this worksheet are that we project the volumes, uh, the prices, uh, the costs, and then we uh, calculate the three uh, financial statements, income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow statement. Uh, we also have schedules for the calculation of the free cash flows, uh, projected uh, key financial ratios. Um, we also look at the cost per barrel to understand the cost structure a bit in uh, more in more detail. And then we also have schedules for the fixed assets and for the for the financial debt if needed. Then we have an additional worksheet which is made for a limited partner, general partner arrangements. We have here five uh, types of investors. As you can see, we have here three uh, revenue streams from oil, gas and NGL, natural uh, gas liquefied. And then we have um, a forecast schedule. As you can see here, this forecast is stops. Uh, after 25 years and the reason is that we assume this project will only last for 25 years. However, we can also see that there is still some positive cash flows and there is a positive, um, actually EBITDA, and there's a positive EBITDA margin. So instead of stopping this project, we can actually capture additional profits if we prolong this project. I can go up to 50 years and now what we can see is that actually uh, there are some more years of profitability here but then the EBITDA margin drops below zero so maximum I could get maybe get to 33 years this uh, tells me how at one point my EBITDA becomes negative so for our purpose let's say I'm willing to run this project for 30 years and that's basically what I'm going uh, what I'm going to do. Now then we have another look here. We have here a section where which summarizes the key financial metrics. We have here also all the other charts, but um, these basically give you the what's the IRR of what how much funding is required. You can look at this uh, unlevered or levered. Um, unlevered is maybe the most meaningful in some cases in case you have some financial debt you can input if not you can put this to zero and then this becomes basically the same but for our say for argument's sake let's say we get some financial debt so we can push the IRR a bit up from from here uh, if you are interested in DCF valuation or NPV valuation you can input the this contract here and you can run <coughs> this model with different discount rates and see what will be the resulting NPV. Then <coughs> uh, further down below we have a table for uses and sources of funds. We have here one section for three capex accounts. These are the initial investments uh, which have to be done uh, upfront. And then we have some additional expenses also to be paid at the, to, in order to kick off this, um, this project. Um, here is a section which then determines the split among the equity stakes at the shareholder level. We have here a GP and the investors. What you can do, you can just enter the uh, different equity stakes and then here the, the, uh, the promote uh, structure. This is a standard model. It's just one way to do that. Um, 
Okay, then let's mainly have a look at this main assumption. So the model, how it works is that we uh, say uh, what's the potential for this, uh, for this well. So we can input the peak oil production, then we uh, can input the ramp up schedule. And then what we do is we assume here depletion rate. That means um, from the previous year, we always multiply by this factor here so that we can model this uh, the slight decline in the volumes. We have here different um, volumes we can show. We can do show the gross, uh, the net, and then also the, <coughs> the, the gas types. In terms of gas, what we do is there's a relationship between gas and oil. So what we do is we for, if, if we forecast the, the gross oil production, we can take here a multiple in order to estimate the, the, uh, the gross gas production. We can say how much net uh, will, will be left with us. This which is net is always the one which is sellable. And for NGL, we also can say <coughs> what's the multiple in terms of the um, um, the, the ratio between NGL and, and oil, and so we can get to the forecasted NGL volumes. The pricing model works as um, this way, that we input the our expected oil price. We have here um, some years where you can expect uh, input any expected price increases. If you, in, if you say in the long term you assume a slight increase, then you can uh, just enter this in last years and then it will go through all the way through the model and will show this increase. Um, gas and the NGL prices in this model are assumed to have a relationship with the oil price. So that's why we have here these percentages. You can say how much, um, what's the relationship between oil price and gas price. So what you should do is you should set this in a way and then basically check if that's the, the gas and NGL price you want to project. And now the beauty is as this um, ratio should remain stable, you you don't have to enter a gas and NGL price, you it will basically be driven by your assumed or J um, by your assumed oil oil prices. So it's an easy way to to quickly uh, forecast the um, the, the, um, the prices. Um, for this model purpose, I set it back to zero. I assume stable stable prices going forward. Then <clears throat> we have a look at the cost structure. So this we look on a per barrel uh, perspective. Make it a bit uh, bigger so you can see clearly. So what we're saying is we sell uh, the barrel on average at $50. This $50 um, consist of um, um, not only oil but there is also a gas and NGL component. In this, For this well it's assumed to be minimal but depending on the ratios it can be different. And then what we do is we look at the split. We have here three main cost categories which is basically the variable cost if it's a dependency and sales. We have a kind of different type of variable cost but it's dependent of, on volumes. And then we have the fixed costs. And these are uh, three types of costs you can input here. You can also rename the labels here to uh, to basically uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> to basically put the uh, put the labels in what what you would like to to call it. So <clears throat> depending on that, that's how your cost structure looks like. And this chart tells you. You have $50 in revenues, $8.6 in this example with Steas EBITDA, then EBIT $6.4, and at the bottom line, after paying all interest and taxes, you should remain with $4.60. So <clears throat> you can run this for the lifetime, or you can also look at individual years, how this will develop. And as the model is fully dynamic, <clears throat> you can see it makes a difference, which here we assume as there is a significant decline assumed in the revenues and also the profits. So <clears throat> this model gives you the flexibility to look at it um, in the time period you like to you like to have a look at. Then we have here a capex summary. We have here the three capex ca category mentioned above, and we also have here a table to input some ongoing capex for 
for replacements or for other purchases you have to do over the lifetime of this uh, oil oil well. Okay, <clears throat> then just try to <clears throat> fix this. Then <clears throat> next topic is break-even analysis, and this what we were interested to solve is for the break-even uh, price in terms of the oil uh, price. Um, this one should be here. Just uh, finalizing the template. So in terms of break-even analysis, again, we can have a look at um, one um, single year, or we can look at the project's uh, lifetime. We uh, again choose for the lifetime. And then in terms of break-even, the question is, we want to know if EBITDA is break-even, or we also want to include the um, uh, the capex or count for the capex so you have two options to, to look at i personally like to account for capex so that i understand if also the initial investment is being repaid so when how the model works is that we list um, all the, the costs and in this case we have the capex and we have the fixed um, the total fixed costs during the project's lifetime in that case and in this case we have the barrel cost they're actually now fixed because they are from a if you solve for the prices the the, um, the the volume does not change so we look at it as a we view, we view at it as like as a fixed um, as a fixed uh, cost and once we know what the cost uh, will have to be then we can back solve um, what will be the expected revenue contribution and then we solve what will be the break-even oil price or resulting a break-even oil price for this model and on this chart then we can see what is our assumption what is the break-even price so we have some buffer assumed but we also know in case the oil price drops then we might be in trouble if we are lower than break if the price will in reality gets lower than the break-even price another way to look at this is to look at it from a cost and revenue perspective so at break even uh, you will have this um, you have these revenues per barrel on average you obtain and as this corresponds to the costs we can look at these uh, different cost categories and now <clears throat> this might help you to identify maybe ways how to transform some of these costs from fixed into variable costs and in this way lower the break even uh, price point that's the idea of this graphic then we have here a sensitivity analysis uh, in order that this um, works what we will do is we will have to do um, settings change so that the tables are updated automatically and I can run sensitivities on the levered or the unlevered uh, IRR so the way that it works is that we look at the starting point, that's our base case, um, levered IRR. And now the question is what happens if we, for instance, increase the oil price by 5% steps and total 10%. And you can see this is how the IRR is expected to react based on this uh, model, or then in the opposite way it will go down. So each of these um, dimensions is then plotted on this uh, chart so that we can understand which ones are the important assumptions of this model and what will be their impact on the, on the result in terms of the IRR. And I will now set this back to the unlevered IRR and basically I can update the charts as needed. Um, once I'm done with this, um, table i'm going back and set this to uh, calculate up automatically except for data tables so that not every time i have to wait until the tables are updated and then below you have a general assumptions sections for a section for this model so that's basically what i wanted to show you i hope this gives you good understanding what this model can do and how it works I hope this walkthrough was useful. If yes, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and visit our website efinancialmodels.com. A link to the model is included in the description below. Thank you for watching.